Good morning from Oakland, California. It's 11 o'clock here and it is two o'clock in the west, in the east and welcome to uh, visit, chat with me, Rosemary Bray McNatt. I'm president of Star King School for the Ministry and um, it is good to be with you and to see you. Um, it is a very typical Wednesday in a lot of days. I had the meetings I usually have. Uh, it's the first um, Wednesday of the month, so I have a set of meetings this in the morning and another set this afternoon. They're kind of scheduled. Um, hi, Xander. Hi, Matthew. Um, it's good to see you here. And in a lot of ways, things are pretty normal. School's going on. People are working. Um, hey, Kim, nice to see you. In, in a lot of ways, things are just as they always are. And we all know in a lot of ways, things are nothing like they are, usually. If we are blessed enough to have a job, many of us have had to make other arrangements to do that job. We're at home, in our dining rooms, holed up in our bedrooms, taking over a certain other place in the house, depending on how big or small your apartment or house is. Um, and it's a blessing. Hi, Gary, how are you? It's a blessing to be able to do that. But for some of us, uh, life isn't going to be the same. There are many people who aren't working. There are many people who are unsure or whose hours have been cut back. And looming over all of that is this specter of a changed world. Um, a world changed by an insidious virus. And uh, it's insidious not just because it's a disease, but because there's so much we don't know. It's called novel coronavirus for a reason. And uh, I've been monitoring the scientific parts of it with a lot of interest and noticing the ongoing effect that it's having. But I think that what has been weighing on my heart is the spiritual implications of, of this disease and the way that it has ravaged the country and the world. Understanding that we are only at the beginning of this, not at the end of it. It's really hard to, to hear that and to know that. Um, I feel very moved, not only by the stories that I'm hearing, about the heroism uh, of the frontline people. The stories of doctors and nurses and physicians assistants and nurses aides and respiratory therapists and janitors and other housekeeping people and the food service people, just all the cumulative stories are stories of enormous bravery. I don't know what we will be able to do to honor all of those people who serve in our hospitals and long-term care facilities and clinics and emergency rooms. But we need to start thinking about how we can help them, not only to celebrate the work that they've done, but to help them get past what it is that they've seen. This is on my mind a lot because of my introduction into trauma and disaster ministry, which came almost 20 years ago um, as a newly settled minister in New York City who gave her first sermon two days before the September 11th attacks. And that attack and what happened after was a primary driver and shaper of my ministry. I wouldn't have said that at the time, but it shaped immensely um, what kind of minister I became and how I thought about church life and what I thought was important. Uh, it shaped my desire to work as a team, to know that there were things and people um, that needed to know what the other people in the uh, church community and staff knew. And I think that that has fed my ministry since and certainly um, the way I try to, 
to do business at Star King as the leader of our institution. I think that it's going to be really important um, for someone or some ones, because it's going to take more collective thinking to pastor all those who have been in what is essentially um, a war. People, there are people who are trying to push back against that metaphor. They don't like it. It's too violent. But there's no other way to describe what is happening to people in hospitals right now, not just the patients, but for all those who are fighting to save the lives of those patients. And their spiritual needs, their emotional needs are not even close to being addressed. The other people who are being lost in the conversation uh, about what's happening in this country and this world are the chaplains, the religious people of all faiths and many faiths for those who are interfaith chaplains. What is happening to their role in hospital life? Some of them are completely unable to do the work that they've been called to do. They must console and comfort by phone. They must stay outside of the healing, um, the emotional and spiritual healing that chaplains bring. Their listening ear and their listening hearts are being shaped by the need to have social distancing, not just for uh, the sake of the people who are working there, but for the sake of the chaplains themselves so that they don't become ill. It is a heartbreaking time, but it is also a time for which religious leaders like chaplains really are made for. These are the moments that the people that become chaplains um, are prepared to stand up for. I'm really proud of the people who have graduated from Star King, who are serving in these really important ways in hospitals and nursing homes and in the military as chaplains all over our country. I'm proud of all of the people of faith, actually, who are working to make a positive difference in the lives of people who are afflicted by this incredible illness. Um, and at the same time, I am ambivalent about some of the efforts that my religious brothers and sisters um, and siblings are engaged in. I think I mentioned on Facebook on my own personal page that uh, I was very concerned about all of the people that I knew in New York who worked um, in hospitals and who served in congregations. And they've been in my prayers a lot. But I think I reached my breaking point when I saw the hospital, field hospitals being built in Central Park in New York City. Uh, that was especially heartbreaking to me. They were being built uh, in the center of Central Park in the north end, across from Mount Sinai Hospital, which is around 100th Street on the east side of Manhattan. Uh, but I lived on 100th Street on the west side of Manhattan. That was the parsonage where Bob and I and the kids lived for many years. And when I realized that they were building a hospital uh, an emergency, desperately needed field hospital where my kids used to play and run and where we used to take walks and where we used to watch live Shakespeare in the park by a small Shakespeare group in, on the Upper West Side. My heart just broke. Um, it spoke to the desperation of what everybody is dealing with. My feelings altered a bit. I became a bit more ambivalent when I realized that the group that was building those field hospitals were Samaritan, uh, Samaritan's Purse. And they are a group run by 
Franklin Graham, uh, the son of Billy Graham, and uh, notoriously uh, Islamophobic and um, anti-LGBTQI person and community. And once again, I was struck by how easily people who seem uh, motivated by good intent and who provide a deep need are also capable of deep manipulation in the name of religion. And Graham's organization. At the same time, I was learning about disaster and trauma ministry in New York City. At the time, chaplains were being deployed by the Red Cross once we'd been vetted by them and it's being sent to different uh, respite sites uh, near the World Trade Center site. I was working at Respite One, it was called. And Respite One was located at St. John's University. And it was a madhouse, but it was also a place of rest and recovery for the construction workers and the uh, uh, Verizon workers who were trying to install lines for communications down in, the, uh, in that area. So that was a place where people rested. And it was a place where chaplains tried to walk around and just be a listening ear for people who were encountering things in their work that no human being should have to see. And I remember meeting someone from the Franklin Graham organization who, when we were talking, myself and another Unitarian Universalist uh, minister who was serving, uh, spoke to us about what a successful day it had been because he believed that he had cured at least one person of their lesbianism. That was a wake-up call to me about how vigilant it's important to be in the name of progressive values in faith uh, at a time when people are most vulnerable. New York is a very vulnerable place. The country is a very vulnerable place right now. And religion, instead of being a balm and a source of strength, is all too often used as a way of manipulating and frightening and oppressing people because of their identity, because of their religious affiliations, because of their gender expression. And it's never a great experience, but it is an especially enraging experience in these days. It's, a, it's one reason I'm so proud of the work that Star King School of, for the Ministry does. We help to train progressive religious leaders so that we provide an alternative. We provide a different, broader, more inclusive, more loving view of the life of the Spirit and the ways it can work, not just in times of disaster, but in regular and ordinary life. Our people are out in the world being an alternative voice, making sure that people know that religion is not meant to oppress, but to liberate. And Unitarian Universalism and multi-faith work that we support here is a liberatory and life-giving response to really terrible circumstances. It's an honor to be able to participate in the training and formation of people who can be those lights in the shadow. And I'm grateful that I have an opportunity in the midst of this really unsettling time to 
help to provide a way for those folks to be trained. Um, I don't do it alone. I have a fantastic community of people with whom I work. The faculty and the staff of Star King are an amazing group of people who are working from their bedrooms and at their kitchen tables so that we can continue the work of the school. And the work of the school does continue. Uh, we're already uh, deep into our preparations for the move to Mills College um, in Oakland. Our committee just met yesterday to begin our conversations about what we needed to make sure happened, um, what the touchstones needed to be, um, so that people felt the connection in this new place to what was foundational and is foundational to the life of Star King and Unitarian Universalist and multi-religious ministry. So we're hard at work on that. What we can't predict, and in fact what no one can predict, is what the semester will look like in August. Uh, we are making plans to be able to physically be with one another in August in time for the intensive class. But we are also making plans for the possibility that we will not be able to return to physical, face-to-face -face, uh, theological education. It's right and appropriate for us to uh, get ready for what's next to the degree that we're able to figure out what's next. Uh, but we're all at work on that right now. And the courses that our students need and look for, we have every intention of providing. Uh, we tell that to our applicants. Uh, we're in the middle of our admission cycle for the, for the coming fall. And I want to remind you that that application process is still very much open. So that if you are feeling called in any way to a life of service and a life uh, dedicated to shining light in shadowy places and bringing hope to people who feel discouraged and creating justice in a very unjust and unequal world. Star King may very well be the place for you to consider right now. I hope that some of you got a chance to go to the open house yesterday. And if you didn't, don't despair. We'll soon be scheduling another virtual open house. And even if you can't wait that long, please know that you can always be in touch via the Star King website, sksm.edu. Uh, and let us know of your interest in applying to the school. One of our admissions people will be happy to talk to you and help you think next about what you would like your learning and service to be. Um, we think that there is no better time than this moment that draws in very sharp relief those people who want to make a difference and want to make a difference with the liberatory values of Unitarian Universalism. So we're here and we're anxious to meet with you or talk to you about what's next in your life as you discern your call. I also want to remind those of you who know and love our school that we are so appreciative of the donations that you've sent us. And we are so uh, happy that you continue to have faith in our mission at this really challenging time when there are so many people who are asking for help and who need help. Uh, it is humbling uh, to us that you continue to honor us with your financial gifts at a time when so many people are clamoring for those same gifts. I also want to remind those of you who may find yourself in a difficult position uh, financially that it is no time for you to feel burdened by a commitment you might have made to us when times were different. So please let us know if 
at this moment you'd like to suspend your pledge or you need to rethink it, let us know about that. Um, let us uh, work with you so that if you need to stop right now, that you can. And of course, uh, we know that that has no uh, relationship to your love for and the support of the school. So we want to extend that love and support to you right now if this is a burdensome time for you. Please let us know about that. I'm checking the comments to see who's here, to see if anybody wants to ask me a question. Oh good, we know when the open house is. It's scheduled already. The next virtual open house is on April 28th. And if you look in the chat box, you will find a link uh, to that open house to register. And um, our Vice President for Advancement, Jessica Cloud, is online and reminds us that our donors are the best. They are. And they are committed to the values of the school. And we are grateful for them. Um, and I have seen a couple comments about celebrating the move, because the move is exciting for us. There are all kinds of things that we're going to be able to do. Um, and all kinds of partnerships that we hope to create at this moment. So there's a lot of energy and um, excitement about what's next in the life of Star King in this new place of partnership. Um, ah, here's something interesting. Not a single donor has postponed their monthly gift or decreased their giving. What an honor and a tribute that is. Uh, not to us necessarily alone, but to them. And to all of you who have this commitment to Star King. I hope that you will communicate with us around this whole new beginnings process about the move, about what we're doing next, about contingency plans. Uh, because, of course, we need to make contingency plans. We don't know. Uh, what the state of the nation will be in regard to this virus. And more important to us than anything else is the health and the safety of our faculty and our staff and our students. So if we need to teach differently as the months continue, we are prepared to do that. If we are going to settle into a face-to-face -face, uh, theological uh, education in the fall, we are excited to be welcoming people to the Mills campus. And that's our hope and expectation. Um, we are dreaming of the day when this particular trial has passed and that we'll be able to um, welcome you to the campus of Mills, show you around, uh, let you take a look at Star King's uh, new offices, and we've almost pinned down where that will be. It's harder and slower to do that when you're not allowed on campus. Mills is, of course, on lockdown, just as Star King is on lockdown. Um, and people are not permitted to be walking around uh, in those spaces as much as we would love to see them. So it's a challenging time, but we're ready. We are ready um, for almost any eventuality. And we look forward to welcoming you uh, in the fall. I want to uh, end this time together with a time of prayer, as I have done each week. Um, I hope that you'll join with me as we reflect together on the lies we're leading right now. Please join me with me in the spirit of meditation and prayer. Gracious Spirit of all life, God of many names and one abundant love, we are living in such an uncertain moment. And we know that we are not unique. We know that human beings have always faced an especially virulent illness and disease when they knew much less about what was happening to them than we know now. And so we count on you to strengthen us, to co-create with us the wisdom and the knowledge and the insight to combat this disease and to protect 
the most vulnerable people among us. We ask a prayer for all those who have already been afflicted by this virus. We ask that their healing be perfect in every way. We know that we can't define what perfect healing is for each person, but we know, Spirit, that you can. And so we ask for perfect healing for all people, even if that healing is not what we expect it to be. We pray for the frontline workers, for every person who is doing their best to protect and to serve and to save those people afflicted by this illness. Every person in housekeeping, every person serving food, every person taking blood pressures and looking for ventilators and who are immersed in one of the most challenging portions of their respective careers. Give them strength and give them continued purpose. Help them to remember the importance of why they are there and give them the confidence to continue even when they don't have everything they need, even when they are putting themselves at risk. We pray for their families, that they keep up their courage and that they stay well and that they too can be part of the solution that we're all trying so hard to be. We pray for those of us in isolation who are at home, who are struggling to keep faithful to what's been asked of us right now. We've not been asked to face this illness directly. We've been asked to help other people not become ill. Advice that we've received about acting as though each of us were already infected should be a guidepost for each of us to care for our neighbor by caring for ourselves, by staying home, by finding use ourselves, by not working too hard, because some of us manage our anxiety and our fear by putting our heads down and going to work. But we can't work all the time. It's not good for us. So help us to take some moment of leisure and a reminder to be grateful and thankful for the gifts we do have, the capacity that we do have to stay home, the capacity that we do have to reformulate our work. Help us to cultivate a spirit of gratitude. And for those of us who have lost our jobs, who are unsure about our employment, who don't know how we're going to watch our kids and pay our mortgage. We ask a special prayer to ease their anxiety and to show them a way forward. Help them know that they are held in the light, just as we are, and that there will be a way forward for them in some way that we cannot yet foresee. We pray finally for all those who are the most vulnerable, those without homes, those without food, those who may be sick and don't know, but who have so many other challenges that even the coronavirus takes second or third place in the fight that they have for survival. Help us to use this incredibly difficult time as a way of reorienting ourselves toward justice and mercy and an equitable, compassionate world. We ask these things in the name of all that is holy. Amen. Ooh, I prayed us right up to 1129. I want to thank you for being with us today. I want to remind you that I'm going to be doing Facebook Live every week from 11 to 1130 Pacific time. If you have questions about what we're doing next, about the school, about um, how we're teaching, about what classes we're offering in the fall, please uh, email us at starking, uh, sksn.edu, and let us know how we can answer your questions. Thanks for being with us, and please be careful, be safe, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands, 
and stay home. Um, I look forward to seeing you soon. Take care.